Welcome to this virtual training entitled Strategies to Advance Behavioral Health Outcomes Using Telehealth. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our trainer for today, Dr. Stephen Thorpe. Thank you so much, Maria, and good morning to all of you. It's very nice to see you on this uh, on early on this Monday morning. Um, hopefully all of you are having a good new year so far. I'm excited to talk with you about telehealth today. Um, and as Maria said, if you have questions at any point, uh, don't hesitate to just take yourself off mute and ask the question then. And we should have plenty of time at the end for questions too. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Everybody see that okay? All right. So we're gonna talk about uh, strategies for advancing behavioral health outcomes using telehealth. We've got a lot of stuff to cover today. Uh, we're gonna to talk about um, uh, me a little bit to get us started so you know uh, the context I'm coming from, uh, the terminology that we use when we're talking about telehealth, uh, the different technologies that we use that are considered telehealth. And then we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about video conferencing psychotherapy which for most of us is what we think of when we think of telehealth. Uh, we'll talk about lessons that we've learned through the past uh, 15 years or so of doing research on uh, video conferencing psychotherapy. We'll talk about privacy and safety, including HIPAA, uh, and we'll talk about engagement strategies. So, um, so I went to college at Sonoma State uh, University up the road in wine country, had a great experience there. And while I was in college, I uh, worked at three different places uh, for residential treatment for children. I loved that work, loved working with the kids, but there were a lot of challenges in that work too. Um, did my graduate training at the University of Nevada at Reno, uh, and it was fantastic. Uh, one of my mentors there was Steve Hayes, who's the guy who developed acceptance and commitment therapy, if you guys are familiar with him. Uh, or that treatment. Um, my other uh, primary mentor was Alan Prezetti, who is uh, Marsha Linehan's first student. So if you're familiar with dialectical behavior therapy, DBT, um, those were the two things that I did for the seven years that I was in graduate school is uh, ACT and DBT and CBT. Uh, while I was in graduate school, I worked at a counseling center in a forensic setting, uh, an inpatient setting, uh, a for, uh, the VA hospital uh, there in Reno, uh, and then on internship came down to UCSD. And at all of those places, I applied uh, CBT and DBT and ACT. Uh, at none of those places did I, did I do any uh, video telehealth because of course it didn't exist yet. We barely had the internet. So, um, so I'll tell you about some of the things that we've learned uh, since we've been doing telehealth. I'm licensed and board certified. I have an uh, ABAP in clinical psychology. And I'm a researcher. I've published a lot on treatment for veterans and for older adults in particular, um, and uh, for PTSD in particular. And a lot of my publications relate to telehealth. Uh, I was the principal investigator on five big grants on telehealth, uh, uh, got about $6 million in grant funding. And uh, part of that was to establish a clinical uh, center for telehealth uh, at the VA here in San Diego. And so we started that, I would say about six years ago at this point, um, and it uh, started out strong and it's only gotten better actually and bigger because uh, of a lot of different factors, including of course the pandemic. Uh, and so it's really, really fortunate for us at the VA that we had that infrastructure in place so that we could just transition and start seeing folks with PTSD and depression and other things right from the get-go. Here's one of my um, staff or two of my staff members actually the back of the back of his head uh, and our landing page there. So um, so we've got some polls for you here and uh, and the first question is this one. How many of you are anxious or uncertain about using telehealth? Go ahead and put your responses in. All right, got responses from most of you. So I'm gonna end polling and show you what we're talking about. Um, so most of you fortunately are not anxious or uncertain. Uh, uh, there is a little bit of uncertainty there and uh, anxiety and that makes sense. 
and, uh, and that might be related to the next couple of questions. So how many of you have conducted your work via telehealth prior to COVID-19? So you conducted all of your work through telehealth, you conducted some of your work through telehealth, or uh, you did not conduct any of your work through telehealth. So go ahead and put your responses in for that. And uh, COVID really hit us here in California in March uh, of last year is when we started really locking down. And thank you for submitting your responses. And it looks like about three quarters of you hadn't done any of your work through telehealth and, uh, and uh, just a few of you had, and that's pretty common. That's pretty typical for the responses that we see here. I'll show you the results. Um, so uh, it, that's uh, consistent with what we see nationally and internationally. There's a Pew study that assessed people, they just happened to be assessing people in February of last year about telehealth issues. And at that time, 0.4% had, so uh, less than half of 1% uh, had uh, been using telehealth in their work. And then they conducted another one in July and it was over 40%. I expect over this point, at this point, it's well over 50% of you uh, have been doing telehealth and um, uh, that's consistent. And then finally, how many of you are now conducting your work via telehealth? All right, um, and uh, so you can see from the poll results that uh, most of you, about three quarters of you again, are conducting some of your work through telehealth. And it's probably even more than that, as we'll talk about the definition of telehealth. Um, it, it's a broad spectrum of things, but certainly in terms of video conferencing, uh, psychotherapy, uh, probably that's closer to three quarters of you, uh, which is a huge jump from when uh, you started before uh, COVID. All right, thank you for sharing that. So here's some of the broader context for what we're doing, which is that uh, the prevalence of mental health problems is uh, quite large. About 20% of the population has had any mental illness um, as of 2015. And fewer than half of those individuals received behavioral health services in the previous year. and. That's not even uh, considering what kinds of services they had. We don't know if it was empirically supported treatment or not. Um, that's just uh, fewer than half that had any behavioral health services in the previous year. And those are people that need it. Uh, access is even poor in low income countries, uh, according to the WHO. Uh, and part of the problem is that there are not enough of us. There are insufficient numbers of behavioral health professionals in many regions of the United States. Um, even here in San Diego, um, I, I assume that some of you may be in private practice in addition to your day jobs. Uh, a lot of my colleagues are in private practice, either full or part-time, uh, and they, they're always plenty busy. You know, everybody always talks about saturation. They're worried that there's going to be too many uh, mental health professionals. There are not. Uh, there is a huge demand uh, because we have over 3 million people in the county and, uh, and mental health uh, issues are prevalent. Uh, the other issue is that most of us tend to live in cities like San Diego. Uh, you know, Southern California is a, a pretty busy place to start with. Uh, we are drawn to big cities because there are jobs there, because there are universities there, um, because uh, there are a lot of resources there. And so we're drawn to the big cities, which is terrific for us. And it's not great for people that don't live in cities. Uh, this is a map, this is looking at veterans, but it's representative of non-veterans as well. And you can see where the uh, urban areas are, which are in red. And you can see us in Southern California and you know we've got a lot of big cities down here. Uh, you can see that up in the Bay Area and on the East Coast. And then you see this huge area in the middle uh, that is not urban, that is considered rural or highly rural. Rural uh, settings have difficulties in recruiting and retaining behavioral health care specialists. And as a very concrete example of that, uh, I worked here at the VA for about uh, 16 years, ran the PTSD clinic there. And very often we'd be searching for providers for our uh, veterans who lived in El Centro, which is two hours east of here. And it was nearly impossible to find good mental health providers in El Centro. 
Uh, and so what that means is if you, we couldn't find a provider, that veteran would have to drive two hours each way. And if they're getting psychotherapy, that would typically be once a week that they'd have to you know, drive for four hours, uh, sometimes longer, depending on traffic and accidents and other things. So that's a lot to ask of people. And so a lot of people in rural settings will just give up or choose not to get care at all. Um, the other issue is that uh, people in small towns very likely know the very few uh, behavioral health care providers personally. Uh, and so, uh, and this is an issue in small towns all over for both uh, mental health care and health care more broadly. So, um, so they may be reluctant to talk to somebody that they see socially at school and bump into at the supermarket uh, or the Walmart that happens to be in town. And so, uh, so they'll be uh, reluctant to get started because of that. There are higher costs associated with delivering care in rural areas. That's true of all health care, including mental health care. And uh, many individuals don't have the means to travel great distances to seek specialized behavioral health services. Uh, so they don't have uh, cars for transportation because they're sharing cars or they have other issues. We know that distance to healthcare providers is linked to lower treatment engagement. So the further are you are away, the less likely it is that you're gonna get treatment. And that problem is compounded during times of economic crisis or high fuel prices like right now. Access to behavioral health treatment has historically been particularly limited to individuals in rural settings and to older adults, people with transportation or mobility problems, people who live in institutions or prisons, people who are homeless and underrepresented racial or ethnic groups. And those trends have continued or even worsened during the COVID crisis. Uh, the nature of many behavioral disorders also leads people to uh, potentially avoid stressful situations such as large groups. So a lot of uh, folks that have PTSD, agoraphobia, panic disorder, will avoid shopping and sporting events and restaurants and hospitals. Uh, and because they're not coming to hospitals or because they don't like being in waiting rooms, uh, they will avoid coming in for treatment. Uh, a lot of the folks that I work with are veterans who are combat veterans who have acquired a fear of driving because of roadside bombs, because of IEDs. And so many of them literally stopped driving when they came back to San Diego. And so if they can't drive, that limits uh, what they can get in terms of services. Individuals may be more inclined to seek treatment in familiar and convenient community clinics uh, or from the comfort of their own homes if those options are available to them. So all of that uh, is to say that, you know, most of us are here today because of COVID. Most of you are using telehealth for the first time because of COVID, but, uh, but the technology has much broader applications than just during the pandemic. It, it's a very wonderful, helpful thing to people in rural settings. It's a wonderful, helpful uh, thing to people who live in urban settings, but can't uh, get to your clinic for a variety of reasons. Uh, so this is, it's wonderful that we have this available to us. Telehealth is designed to enable access to services for everyone, regardless of their location. It involves the use of electronic communications and information technology to support healthcare when distance separates two or more parties. So that's the, the technical definition of what telehealth is. Telemedicine refers uh, specifically to using telehealth or for medication management or medical care. Uh, and those services are often provided uh, using all different kinds of devices from a hospital or a clinic or a private office to outpatient clinics or long-term care facilities, ERs, community mental health centers, assisted living facilities, prisons, schools, or people's homes. Telemental health is specific to improving mental health, behavioral health services providing using uh, communication technology. Sometimes the terms telepsychiatry or telepsychology are used when speaking about this technology, uh, typically in the management of psychotropic medications for telepsychiatry and of psychotherapy for telepsychology. A uh, telebehavioral health session between a provider and the person served is referred to as an encounter. And examples of that are conducting assessments or providing psychoeducation or psychotherapy skills by telephone interactive monitoring equipment, personal data assistance, computers, and video conferencing links. 
Uh, we make a distinction in telehealth between synchronous technologies and asynchronous technologies. I'm sure you've heard those terms before. Synchronous technologies include things like telephones, uh, online chat or instant messaging, live webinars like this, uh, video teleconferencing, uh, and all of these involve streaming communication in real time continuously among all parties. So that's what it means is that everybody's taking part at the same time. That's what synchronous is. Uh, and synchronous technologies have the benefits of social engagement, accountability, and immediate feedback. Um, and so, for example, right now during this training, you guys can just take, out, take yourself off mute and ask me a question. And of course, if this was a recorded webinar, um, you wouldn't be able to do that. There's pros and cons of each. Uh, one of the cons of synchronous technologies is that, that it has to reach everyone's um, schedule. So uh, if for some reason somebody wasn't able to meet uh, Monday morning for this, uh, then they wouldn't be able to take part unless they listen to the recording later. Which brings us to asynchronous technologies. Uh, so asynchronous technologies include electronic platforms such as websites, recorded webinars, online training, social media, mobile applications or apps, fax machines, email and text messaging, which you don't usually think about as uh, telehealth. Um, and uh, all of those involve the intermittent transmission of information. I, I made a note there parenthetically about uh, fax machines and email and text messaging. Uh, and of course, with email, you wanna be aware of privacy. Most email is not secure. And so you don't wanna be emailing <clears throat> the names of your uh, patients, for example. Um, you also wanna be careful about other things that might not be as obvious. Text messaging, of course, uh, a lot of our clients use and prefer to use for lots of different reasons. A lot of us do too, because it's convenient. Um, but if you're um, keeping accurate notes, that means keeping notes about any clinical information that's shared via text messaging. So uh, most clinics, most of us, uh, allow text messaging from our patients, but we say it's only for rescheduling or for minor issues like that. We don't like for clients to text message us long paragraphs about their mental health. That's not so useful. We might not be able to respond quickly, uh, but if they do do that, technically you should be including uh, those messages in your notes. So just be aware of that. The other thing that I learned uh, years ago when I was doing a big uh, meta-analysis on telehealth was that fax machines actually store everything that's ever come across them, which I didn't know. So fax machines um, actually can store everything that's been faxed on there. And so if you get rid of your fax machine, you can't just throw it in the trash because all of that information is still on there. Uh, so you need to be aware of things like that too. So asynchronous technologies provide greater flexibility uh, because users can access the information on their own schedule but users may feel more isolated because you don't have that group live interaction. One type of uh, asynchronous technology that you may have heard about is called store and forward. Uh, and all that means is that you're uh, storing the, the health information like clinical history or assessments or images or videos. Uh, and you're making that electronically available to practitioners at any time of day. So, Many of us work in places where we store our progress notes electronically. That's common practice these days. I'm old enough to remember when we didn't have that. And uh, you know, in inpatient settings, we each carry around a giant chart and then we would fight over that chart to see who could uh, either read notes or write new notes. Um, luckily, most of us don't have to do that these days. And we all have stored and forward where we can access things from anywhere and at any time. Any questions about the context for telehealth, the terminology for telehealth before we move on? Okay. Let's talk about the different technologies that we use. I'm gonna start by talking about some of the technologies that are not telehealth. Uh, and these include things that uh, are not electronic, are not used for communication. So standard postal snail mail is used for communication, but it's not electronic. So that's that doesn't count. Uh, neuropsychological testing almost never counts uh, because neuropsych testing, uh, usually there are materials involved. Uh, sometimes we will have people manipulate objects or draw things, and uh, it's harder to do that through telehealth. It's possible. I have colleagues who do this full time, and they've 
uh, done workarounds so that they can do at least some of their neuropsych testing, um, but it doesn't lend itself very well. So certainly the vast majority of neuropsych testing is done in a standard non-telehealth way. Uh, paper questionnaires, medical charts, or brochures, uh, none of those are telehealth. Um, of course, you can share those things uh, through telehealth. There's usually ways to do it through the telehealth uh, software that you're using. Uh, but if they're traditional and literally paper, they are not. Uh, digital watches typically are not telehealth. They're just digital watches. Uh, however, of course, uh, more and more people are buying smartwatches. And if you have a smartwatch or a tracker, uh, then there are uh, elements of telehealth in those. Uh, they can give you feedback directly that you could have that shared uh, with yourself in, in different ways or shared with other people. So it's possible, but most digital watches are not. Virtual reality software typically is a standalone unit. These cost thousands of dollars and they get really fancy. I have colleagues who study that uh, for PTSD primarily and, um, and it's uh, terrific, but it's not typically telehealth because it's standalone. And then therapeutic gaming. Uh, typically is not telehealth. Uh, so there are things out there like Super Better and some other uh, technologies that are used to both uh, improve mental health uh, while having fun and doing other things. Um, there's also been a push to gamify uh, traditional telehealth and gamifying means to make it more fun, to make it more engaging. And so people might earn points for you know clicking on different digital objects uh, in the platform. Uh, they might be able to go up levels. Uh, there might be good sound effects or good um, uh, graphics for things. Uh, all of that uh, has been used, but it's not yet clear if that's gonna uh, enhance telehealth or not. Here are the common telehealth technologies. And, and the first three here, uh, certainly all of us have used, uh, and you don't usually think about it as telehealth, but it really is. Uh, so the telephone, the email, the fax, they've been around for a long time. They're fairly ubiquitous, so we don't really think about them, but they really are telehealth. Um, and there's some evidence that you can do psychotherapy uh, effectively through the telephone. There are a few studies that you can do um, uh, good uh, mental health exchanges through texting. And uh, text crisis centers have really popped up in the past five years. They've really gotten popular, and some of my students are looking into that in terms of how, how well it works. Um, so those things uh, would be considered telehealth. Internet health services, of course, are telehealth. Uh, these are health services provided through the internet. Um, there's lots and lots of those out there. Mobile health services, uh, which we refer to as mHealth or apps. There's a ton of these out there too. They really, really vary in quality and accuracy. Uh, I've reviewed quite a few of these for PTSD especially. And some of them are outstanding. They're really terrific, really good uh, resources, and uh, the technology is good. And some of them are lousy. They're really clunky and inaccurate and other things. There's not yet a really good way to, um, to evaluate these from a scientific standpoint. There's also something called chatbots. Um, and uh, just out of curiosity, uh, how many of you are familiar with chatbots? Just, just raise your hand in front of your camera if you're familiar with them. So Michelle, Kira, just a couple of you. Um, okay, uh, so, uh, so chatbots have actually been around before they were called chatbots. They've been around, believe it or not, since the early 60s. There was a guy who programmed a computer uh, to act like a person. And what he wanted to show in his study was that people would not like it and that they would quickly realize that it was a computer. What he found instead, what he found by accident and against his wishes really, was that people had no idea that it was a computer. They thought it was a real person. And secondly, that they really enjoyed the interaction. So uh, he called it Eliza after Eliza Doolittle, if you remember from My Fair Lady. Um, that uh, he was kind of uh, training Eliza to be more uh, human and more social and more polite in the interactions. And it worked really well. So people really liked it, they enjoyed it, uh, and they didn't know that it was a computer for the most part. Uh, so that was in the early 60s. So you can imagine how much the technology has evolved, how, how uh, much better programming is, um, all of that. So now uh, there are chatbots developed where you can uh, literally interact with a program, with a computer, and carry on a conversation. So it can be about anything. So a lot of the websites that you visit may have chatbots where you 
talk to somebody, but it's not really somebody, it's just the computer. And you're saying, can you help me figure out how to get access to this? Or um, my account seems like uh, it's got a problem and the chat bot can interact with you. But uh, more relevant to what all of us are here for, you can also use chat bots for uh, mental health services. And the remarkable thing is that uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people are using chatbots. They download apps onto their phone that are chatbots. They interact with them and they know full well that these are computer programs. They know that they are bots and yet they download them and they use them daily because they like it. They enjoy venting and uh, talking with this supportive text uh, uh, relationship. So kind of a, a brave new world in terms of chatbots as well. Okay, um, and then finally, uh, clinical video teleconferencing. And so, um, so that's what I've spent uh, much of the past 15, 20 years studying, and I'm gonna be talking to you about that a lot. So we've done research on uh, mHealth, on apps uh, for PTSD especially. We've actually developed a whole series of apps. Um, and if you're interested in apps for different things, uh, we developed it through a, a collaboration between the VA and the DOD, and we developed over a dozen of them. So we, we started with one called the PTSD Coach, uh, which is for PTSD, obviously. And it's kind of crude looking back, but it, it served its function and it's been downloaded a zillion times in a zillion languages. Uh, it's free. And so PTSD Coach is for PTSD. And then we got uh, all, of, all of us, uh, as you see, uh, our, our authors here, we're all PTSD people. So we were really, really interested in PTSD. So we started with PTSD coach and then we went to something called prolonged exposure coach, which is a treatment for PTSD and then cognitive processing coach or CPT coach. Uh, and then we branched out to other things. So we have an app for ACT for acceptance and commitment therapy. We have an app for uh, quitting smoking, smoking cessation called stay quit. Um, but there's a whole lot of them and most of them have that coach in the title. And so if you just do a, a search on your, uh, you know, on your Apple store or wherever you get your apps, um, you can look for coach or PTSD coach or things like that. And you'll see related things there. So we've done research on those. Uh, this is again, the first one that we developed called PTSD coach. Uh, so this was mostly uh, uh, myself and a group at Stanford and Palo Alto. And uh, as you can see, it's got a learning section, which is psychoeducation. It's got a self-assessment section, which in this case is something called the PTSD checklist or the PCL uh, to assess PTSD symptoms, uh, a way to manage symptoms. So some quick uh, coping skills, and then a way to find support, which was resources for PTSD and for mental health more broadly. We could also customize it so that if people were feeling very stressed from their PTSD, they could access photographs from their photo library that would be soothing. They could access music from their music library that would be soothing. Um, and so that was the idea behind that. Uh, some assessments like neuropsych require materials that may make evaluation more difficult via telehealth, like I said. Uh, any threats to the validity of testing via telehealth like distractions or technical problems should be documented. Um, because when you're doing telehealth, of course, you have less control of the environment. If I'm doing neuropsych testing with somebody and I have them come in my office, I can literally clear the desk. I can clear the wall. I can make sure that it's, they're going to be able to focus clearly on this. I can, uh, you know, block outside noises. But if they're at home and I'm testing them, they might have their phone next to them. Their child might be bursting in at any moment. You can't control that. So if that happens, you just make a note of it and do the best you can. You can also assign a proctor to the remote site. So you could have somebody visit them in their home or in the community clinic and uh, provide some of the materials or technical support to verify the person's identity and to keep the testing materials secure because you can't just send them a waste, for example, for IQ testing. Any questions about any of uh, the telehealth issues uh, broadly or the different ways we do telehealth? Okay, well, let's talk about video conferencing psychotherapy. So here is a, another one of my uh, uh, staff people for our studies. And I, I've included this to, just to show you the setup that we had. 
Um, and this is through Cisco systems. We used a, a number of different models over the years uh, for doing telehealth. Um, but this is the big bulky stuff that we had to use in the VA system. Um, and it was super expensive. It was thousands and thousands of dollars and it wasn't super reliable. The graphics weren't great. If you guys remember the early years of YouTube where most of the videos were really pixelated and grainy, uh, that's the way a lot of our um, video feeds were. And so, um, so that's what we used. But you can also notice that the cameras we used, um, if it's not obvious, are deep. And the reason they were deep is that we wanted to be able to zoom in. And there's some advantage to that that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, for all of you and for all of us, uh, we have lots of other options available to us today. And most of you are probably using one of these platforms when you do your video teleconferencing. So there's Doxy, Simple Practice, Zoom, like we're on right now, uh, VC. And uh, so these are the most popular ones out there. The principles I'm talking to you about today are not specific to any one platform. Most of the kind of bells and whistles that I'll be talking about uh, are available on each of these platforms, either in their basic version or a premium version. Um, and so you can kind of play with the one that you're using. So I coined the term video conferencing psychotherapy uh, to specifically describe the use of video teleconferencing platforms for psychotherapy. Uh, and that could be for individuals or couples therapy or groups or families. Uh, because the research literature is all over the map and it calls it lots of different things. Um, and I wanted to be clear about what it is that, that most of us do. Uh, VCP has been studied for decades. And so I'm going to talk to you about the evidence for it. Um, and our first big paper, uh, which was a meta-analysis that we published in 2011, uh, reviewed 65 peer-reviewed uh, papers up to that point. Um, here's that paper. And uh, one of the things that we looked at was the terminology used. And so the terminology included uh, for, for traditional psychotherapy included face-to-face, in-person treatment, uh, same room treatment, office-based treatment, or on-site treatment. Uh, and so all of these are still used in the literature today. I prefer in-person treatment because it's the most accurate. It's the most comprehensive. If you say face-to-face, -face, like all of us are face-to-face -face right now, but we don't mean uh, in-person traditional psychotherapy. The terminology used for VCP included video conference, telepsychiatry, telemedicine, telehealth, uh, remote treatment, computer-based treatment, uh, two-way TV, uh, there is a couple of studies published back in 1961, believe it or not, the very first teleconferencing papers, uh, and they called it two-way TV because it was literally two TVs connected to each other, uh, but in different rooms. Uh, and it's also sometimes called internet-based treatment, although that's not specific to what we're talking about. Um, and since uh, we published that first paper, lots of people have kind of taken that term and studied it uh, separately, video conferencing psychotherapy. So what we learned is that even um, back in 2011, uh, diverse samples and psychotherapies had been studied. Uh, and we looked at lots of different things, not just um, symptom outcomes, which is really important. That's what most of us really care about. But we all also looked at the feasibility of doing this work, the therapeutic alliance, the satisfaction by the client and by the therapist, all of those things were uh, examined in these studies. So the, the big drum roll, the punchline here is that there were no significant differences between video conferencing psychotherapy and in-person psychotherapy in terms of uh, symptom reduction outcomes in PTSD and anxiety and depression and eating disorders and anger, addictions or physical health concerns. That's great news. That, that means that this works just as well as uh, in-person care does. So there's strong evidence that video conferencing psychotherapy works. Um, one of the, the technologies that's been studied quite a bit is telephones and telephones are ubiquitous and they're reliable. Uh, most of us have access to them and we can count on them. Uh, though only about 40% of households have landlines now about 96% of Americans have cell phones and 75% of those are smartphones. That's really just been a, a curve that looks like this over the past 10 years. Uh, and 98% of uh, United States citizens have one or both types of telephone. Psychotherapy over phones can be good. 
but it lacks the clarity of nonverbal language. So you lose the nonverbals, of course. Uh, there's a need for a backup contact. So what happens if you're on the telephone and you lose the connection? And uh, for folks that are on cell phones, there's a temptation to roam to public settings. And so uh, often if you're doing clinical work with somebody on the telephone, you might find out that they're on a walk around a lake or that they're at Starbucks or they're shopping for groceries. And that's not ideal for them to be talking about their traumatic event, for example. So you wanna keep those things in mind and maybe have some guidelines in your informed consent about that. On a phone, you lose the ability to emphasize points with your facial expressions and your hands and to read the body language of the person you're providing services to. Um, we're not gonna do this today, but you can compare audio versus video in a clinical situation if you haven't had that experience yourself. And I can tell you that audio telephone is much, much better than nothing. It, it really is much better than nothing. And you can convey a lot of information verbally and, and with your tone. And it's not nearly as good as video. Video is just much, much better. It's much richer than telephone. So now imagine providing services uh, through video conferencing psychotherapy versus in person. Uh, and that's a much smaller gap. Um, we are able to do nearly everything the same and see the people we serve. Almost everything we do in terms of our clinical work is done with our face and our voice. And we can see each other, we can hear each other. So most of what we do, we can do over video conferencing psychotherapy. There are some things that are different. I'll talk about those, but for the most part, it's very similar. Uh, when it comes to reimbursement for uh, video conferencing psychotherapy, 48 states and Washington DC provide reimbursement for live video. Uh, but uh, most of them don't provide reimbursement for telephone only. Um, and that's, that's true for Medicaid fee for service. 38 states and Washington DC have laws that govern private payer telehealth reimbursement. Um, and so the laws as always are trying to catch up with technology. People are reassured uh, when they hear clinicians and staff talking positively about video conferencing psychotherapy. So that's the, the first thing I would recommend to you is that even if you're uh, one of the folks in the poll earlier on that's feeling some anxiety about doing this work, that's totally understandable. All of us uh, felt anxiety the first time that we did this work. Um, and some of you uh, may not feel anxious about it, but you hate it. I, I have a colleague, uh, you know, for the past year, I have taught all of my classes uh, at my university to doctoral students. All of them have been online since mid-March. Uh, and one of my colleagues just hates doing uh, telehealth uh, teaching. She hates teaching her classes that way. So even if you're a person that doesn't feel anxiety necessarily, but you really don't like this technology, try not to share that with your clients, right? That's not a good way to sell it to them. And indeed, it really is a wonderful technology. There are a lot of advantages to it, even if most of us would prefer to be in person. I still, after all these years, would much rather be in person with somebody than via telehealth. And at the same time, I'm super grateful that we have the technologies that we do. If the pandemic had hit us 20 years ago, I can tell you, uh, many more of us would be out of jobs altogether, uh, and many of us wouldn't be able to help our clients the way we are now uh, because we have the technology that we do, not to mention the streaming services for TV shows and movies and music and things that we all have access to. So uh, we're very fortunate that way, and yet I'd still rather be in person. Uh, in addition to the advantages of video conferencing psychotherapy to in-person care, uh, for example, it allows people to get services without traveling, uh, they don't have to park, which might not seem like a huge deal, but really in San Diego and LA, it is a huge deal. And bear in mind that if you have a major depressive disorder, if you have PTSD, if you have panic disorder, parking all by itself can be really stressful. So for a lot of my folks with PTSD, for example, they get out of their car and then they hear other car doors or trunks slamming shut, that concussive sound, they can't stand it. So parking is a big deal. Um, waiting rooms are a big deal. So if your clients have uh, many of the major mental disorders, um, sitting in a room full of strangers is not easy. Uh, and so being able to avoid that is a huge benefit. Um, and of course, something that we've written about for years is that it separates you from contagious diseases. So if your client comes in, we've all had this experience that your client comes in, 
and they're like, oh, it's been a rough week. And you're like, oh, what's been happening? Oh, I was up all night throwing up and I've just never been so sick. Like, that's not what you want to hear when they're three feet away from you. Um, but when you're doing telehealth, you know, uh, they can be five miles or 50 miles and uh, you're not at risk from COVID or from the flu or from anything else, which is nice. Uh, we can see each and hear each other nearly as clearly in person with this state-of-the-art technology. So even if you're anxious, reservations about it, even if you hate it, uh, if you're doing this work anyway, and if your clients are doing this work anyway, really try to talk about the positives uh, of this experience. We'll discuss strategies for engaging the people we serve a bit later, uh, and I'll allow, allow time at the end for questions about any specific concerns you have. But as Marie and I have said, if you have questions, you can always uh, pop in and ask those questions as, as I'm going. Uh, speaking of, uh, any questions at this point? All right, let's talk about some of the lessons that we've learned over all of these years doing video conferencing psychotherapy. We actually had an article uh, that was called Lessons Learned uh, that we published about eight years ago. Uh, and we've learned a lot more since then, as you can imagine, but, uh, but uh, this is taken from that paper. There's another paper that we just published uh, and another paper that we just published. So the first thing to know about um, video conferencing psychotherapy is that it's not perfect. It's good, it's a lot better than it used to be, but it's not perfect. And so all of you have had the experience of doing video conferencing psychotherapy, either formally through your work professionally, or uh, you've been uh, FaceTiming with your family for years or using um, Skype for years. And when you've done those things, certainly you've had a frozen image happen sometimes, either yourself or the people that you're interacting with, uh, kind of ghost images or tracer images, or sometimes there's really poor resolution or weird resolution. It looks um, all fractured. It's like a Picasso painting. Uh, that can happen. Uh, even today, it happens less often, but it certainly can still happen. Uh, and the poor resolution can matter uh, it, when you're doing clinical work, of course. You, you're, you're trying to see how your client's doing, and our clients aren't always great about expressing what they're experiencing. So, um, so you rely on being able to see them, and uh, so that's important. There can also be audio artifacts. We call these artifacts things that get in the way. And audio artifacts include, uh, most commonly, a delay, which uh, even a delay of something like a quarter of a second is hugely disruptive and frustrating. All of you have had that experience either on the telephone or on video conferencing psychotherapy, uh, and it's hugely frustrating, uh, and it happens for different reasons. But when there's a delay, uh, even if it's slight, it can throw things off. There can be an echo that is typically because the person is using two different sources to call in, so that they've called in both on the video equipment and on the telephone, for example. And so there's a feedback loop going. Um, so that can happen. Or there can be mechanical voices. It can sound like, you know, uh, Darth Vader, or it can sound like bad auto tune when you're talking to the person. That happens sometimes too. The worst thing that can happen typically is a dropped call. And so the nature of the work that I do with PTSD, a lot of the treatments that I do are exposure therapies. Uh, and the, the imaginal exposure component of that is having people talk in great detail about the traumatic event they experienced, whether it was combat or sexual assault, whatever it was. So they're talking and they're usually tearful. And so you can imagine a dropped call at that moment is awful. That means literally you lose the connection. Um, so uh, it, it didn't happen to us very often, even back in the old days, fortunately, and it, and it certainly doesn't happen very often now, but it, it can. Um, and one of the times that it happened to us in one of the, the prolonged exposure therapy studies we did, one of my study therapists was working with this client. And I think the client was up north, maybe uh, Escondido or somewhere. And the, the uh, therapist was here in San Diego. And they were in the middle of their very first imaginal exposure session. So the client was pouring their heart out, talking about all the details of what happened. And the call got dropped. And so the therapist was freaking out, scrambling to reconnect, and it took them about five minutes. And finally, they reconnected, and they were just ready to apologize profusely. And they got back on the call. And fortunately, one of the side benefits of PE that we didn't really appreciate back then was that when we have them doing their imaginal exposure, we have them close their eyes so that they can really focus and remember what happened. And so uh, they reconnected, and the client said, 
And then I walked into the room and then I did this and had no idea that the drop, the call had even dropped. So that was very fortunate. Um, there can be challenges exchanging paperwork. So if, you know, if I'm in person, I can hand the person informed consent. I can hand them a questionnaire. I can hand them a, a handout about depression or PTSD. You can't do that uh, if you're doing it through video. There are certainly ways to exchange um, paperwork. You can do it in the chat function. You can send them a link. Uh, you can um, you know, mail them materials and have them fill out that way. Or you can just do it verbally or uh, hold the thing up to the camera. Uh, but when it comes to holding things up to the camera, you can see my hand pretty well coming at you right now. But if you're using a virtual background like I am, sometimes that's not going to be clear. And sometimes it depends on how close you are. So you want to kind of keep that in mind. There can also be heavy internet traffic on holidays. Uh, so uh, many of you may have had the experience last year of trying to call your family on Mother's Day or on Easter and found that it was really slow. And that's because everybody on the planet was doing the same thing. So um, things like that matter. The other issue that we had sometimes is that people are pouring their hearts out. They're talking about things they don't really wanna talk about and they get squirrely and sometimes they will literally move off the screen. And they will do that more often if their chairs are on wheels. And so they will literally just kind of fade off the screen and then you're trying to do psychotherapy but you can't see them anymore. That's not great. And so what we started doing is at all the clinics where we had uh, our teleconferencing equipment set up, we made uh, really heavy chairs there. And so they couldn't really move the chairs. That worked really well. So if you have control over things like that, that's one thing you can do. The other really common issue is that there's apparent poor eye contact. And so like right now, uh, as I'm talking to you, I'm reading slides at the same time. And so you can probably tell that there's uh, this gap, right? That I'm looking down a little bit instead of looking at you right in the eyes like I am right now looking into the camera. Uh, and that's common. And in the old days, we used to worry about this. We used to fret about it more. Now, nobody cares because we all do it um, and we've all gotten used to it, but it was a bigger deal back then. However, if you're interested in uh, correcting what we call the gaze mis mismatch in the literature is that uh, you can buy software that will correct it. It will literally just um, look at the, the degree difference and it will correct it. So if I'm looking down here, it'll just shift it. So I'm looking up here. So there's software that you can pay for to do that. Uh, the simple solution that we used to use is to use the zoom cameras that we had and we would have the person sit far back, about six or eight feet back from the camera. The, the mics are still good at picking up their voice. And we would zoom in on their head and shoulders. And what that does is give you the illusion of eye contact, even though it's not really there. So that's kind of a cool workaround if you have cameras that can zoom. Most laptops don't. Most laptops are just uh, static. They don't pan or tilt or zoom. But if you get a little bit fancier, uh, things that usually connect by a USB externally, you can do that. So here's more examples of the technology that we used to use. These are four of my staff members. Uh, and you can see that uh, Ryan in this case is sitting about eight feet back. Um, and these are two other of my folks. And you can see again, this is how we set things up. So there are pros and cons to doing video conferencing psychotherapy. So we'll talk about those and then we'll take a break in a minute. So some of the downsides of doing video conferencing psychotherapy, in addition to the tech issues that I just talked about, is that it can be harder to read emotions, right? So especially if you have a bad uh, visual connection, uh, if somebody is sniffling, it's hard to tell if they're crying or if they have allergies or a cold. You just can't tell very well if it's pretty uh, granulated, if it's pretty pixelated. Uh, you can't see all of a person, which usually doesn't matter. Most of the communication that we have as persons, as people, is with our faces. And so, uh, you know, when you're listening to me, this is why I'm not focused on my foot right now. Who cares about my foot? You care about my face and what I get excited about and what I'm sad about, and, right? You can see all that. Um, so a, a couple of concrete examples uh, that we, we've seen over the years is that it could be that your person that you're working with is really anxious and they're fidgeting, their hands are like this, but they're in their lap, so you don't know that. Or that their legs are bouncing and you can't see that. So that's a relatively minor thing, but you're gonna miss that. Uh, a more major thing is I had a study therapist about 10 years ago who had been working with this guy for about four or five sessions and was doing prolonged exposure therapy for him. There's another element of that treatment called in vivo exposure where you have the person go out into the world 
and start doing the things that they've stopped doing since the traumatic event, things that cause them anxiety like shopping or going to public spaces. And so, um, so she was checking in with this uh, gentleman about the homework that she had assigned the previous week. And he said, yeah, well, I went in there and you know, I wasn't sure what to do. I was feeling pretty anxious, but uh, my wife told me it was gonna be okay. And so then I went and the therapist interrupted him and she said, wait, your wife was there with you? And he said, yeah. And, and the therapist said, well, I didn't realize that she was going with you when you were doing homework. And he said, well, yeah, she goes with me everywhere because she pushes me in my wheelchair. And the therapist had no idea that this guy was in a wheelchair. Didn't know that he was in a wheelchair, four or five sessions into treatment uh, because of course she couldn't see it. So these are things that we don't usually ask during an intake. Are you in a wheelchair? Like it would be obvious normally. It wasn't obvious in this case. You can't touch the person, uh, which for most of us is fine. Most of us don't touch our clients anyway, but uh, it means things like you don't shake hands. So I, I have some uh, colleagues who really put a lot of weight into shaking hands. And they say, oh, I can tell if the person uh, has sweaty palms, if they're anxious or you know, what kind of a grip they have, are they assertive, are they aggressive? I, I don't care that much about handshakes, but some people do. Uh, you can't smell the person for better or for worse. So if the person has a strong body odor, all of us have probably worked with people who do, um, you can't smell it. Uh, and uh, if the person smells like alcohol, you can't smell it or if they smell like pot, you can't smell it. So those things uh, obviously can have clinical implications. So if you can't smell the alcohol, if you can't smell the pot, if you can't smell the body odor, then you can't work with them on hygiene or maybe don't drink before our sessions, things like that. You also can't offer the person a tissue. So many of us, uh, if our person is crying, if our client is crying, we will offer them a tissue. Um, you can't do that, of course. You wanna make sure that they have tissues near them wherever they are. Um, there's a big debate in the literature about whether to offer people tissues anyway. Is that shutting down their emotions? I always offer tissues uh, and I can't do it. So I make sure that they have a box of tissues nearby. Uh, some of the advantages, in addition to better access that we've been talking about a lot, again, you're separated from contagious diseases. Uh, you're also separated from intimidating people. And so I've done quite a bit of work with uh, murderers and rapists and other folks who have committed crimes. Um, and who are otherwise just really physically intimidating. And if they're 70 miles away, I don't care so much about that. Uh, it's obviously much more convenient uh, to do video conferencing psychotherapy. There's uh, less or no traffic to deal with. There's no parking to deal with. There's no waiting rooms to deal with. All of that uh, comes with huge benefit to you and your client. And this side benefit that we never expected when uh, this technology was first being investigated, I have colleagues in Hawaii who really pioneered a lot of the great things that we learned because they had to. They used to, the, to fly their clinicians from Hawaii to Guam and to all the islands across 3,000 miles in the Pacific. And they couldn't afford to do it anymore because of gas prices. So they had to develop something else. They developed early versions of telehealth. And they would run groups through teleconferencing and found that it worked really well. They published on that. And one of the side benefits was that they would run groups in person like all of us have and uh, like all of us have experienced, sometimes there would be disruptive people, people would be having side conversations, people would be passing notes to each other. And they found that when they did it through video teleconferencing, that didn't happen nearly as much. That people were more paying attention, more focused, more pay, you know, uh, take, taking notes and keeping track of things. And uh, they think that it's because it was novel and because there was this implied authority of being on TV. They looked like news anchors. Uh, they had it uh, posted up in the corner. They had their TV up in the corner and they feel like people were like paying attention because it seems like they were authority figures. They were up there on TV. So that was kind of a side benefit that they didn't expect. Um, so one of the things that was remarkable to me is that uh, I had, I hired a, a couple of dozen of um, study therapists from around San Diego County and uh, all of them were new to uh, video conferencing psych psychotherapy, actually. And most of them were new to doing research and to doing manualized treatments. Most of them were new to being videotaped while they were doing psychotherapy. And most of them didn't use a lot of technology in their private lives either. So all of that was new to them. Uh, nearly all of the clinicians were skeptical about doing uh, video conferencing psychotherapy as I was. Uh, however, uh, a lot of them grew to really like it. And some of them still, I, I'm in contact with them, 
prefer video conferencing psychotherapy to in-person care for some of the reasons that we've talked about. They don't have to travel, it's more convenient for their clients, they can serve more people, uh, they don't have to worry about some of these things. And so uh, I never in, in a million years would have predicted that. Um, some clients too prefer the therapeutic distance of video conferencing psychotherapy, especially if they're sharing information that is embarrassing or upsetting or taboo or illegal. Um, and if they're sharing any of those things, uh, then video conferencing psychotherapy can be kind of a foot in the door. These are things that if they had to face another person, you know, three or four feet away, they can never disclose these things. They can never admit these things. Uh, but if they're on video conferencing, they feel more comfortable, uh, which is kind of this cool side effect. So they will disclose things like that. We've had uh, several individuals in their 80s successfully complete treatment. One of my um, clinical populations that I love working with is older adults. I know that some of you do too. And, uh, and we've found that certainly they can utilize the technology and actually take advantage of the technology. They can raise the volume on the computer or on their headphones to help with hearing impairments. And a lot of headphones, of course, uh, are noise cancellation technology. So it actually uh, blocks out the ambient noise, which really helps people who are hard of hearing to hear better. Um, and make sure, of course, that if you're doing work with people who are hard of hearing, that they can uh, see the lips because lips really matter and they're going to rely on lip reading just as much as ever. So there are lots of different formats for doing video conferencing psychotherapy. You can do it uh, in your office, um, you know, from office to office. And that's most of what we've done. And so typically uh, I would be uh, in a hospital or in a clinic. My client would drive to a hospital or a clinic and we would do uh, in office to in office that way. But you can do that one-on-one uh, -on -one individually, or you can do it in couples format. You can do it in family format. You can do it in group format uh, because we've studied all of those things and it's worked well in all of those formats. You can also do in home psychotherapy, although that's been studied much less. Uh, we've actually done some big studies on in home uh, psychotherapy through telehealth but there, there hasn't been a lot out there, but certainly you can do it. And it's even more convenient. People literally can just uh, roll out of bed and hop on the device and, and uh, they're going. So we've studied that and we found that it worked uh, well as well. In-home care uh, has some advantages in that it's more convenient. Uh, it also allows observation of the client's home and their neighborhood. And so often when we're first getting to know them, we'll say, can you take me on a little virtual tour and, uh, you know, just hold your device out so that I can see kind of where you live. And uh, for some of the social workers that I work with, uh, they'll ask the client to see the inside of their refrigerator or the inside of their medicine cabinet so that they can see if they're taking all the medication, if there's any medication they don't know about, things like that. Um, we'll sometimes have them uh, walk outside so we can see their neighborhood a bit because if we're doing exposure therapies, you know, for one of you, I might say, you know, what you really need to do is uh, exercise more and be social more. So what I want you to do is uh, every night I want you to take a walk around the block just to get out there and see people and see, you know, people walking their dog and wouldn't that be great? And it would be great if you live in a safe neighborhood, but if you don't live in a safe neighborhood, that's a terrible idea. And so um, it's things like that that we pay attention to. Um, and uh, of course, you can look at this too. So if you have them uh, scan their house and it looks like they're hoarding, you would want to know that. Uh, if it looks, you know, like really poor hygiene, you would want to know that. Um, you can see again if they're if they have enough food and medications. Um, and you can also get a, a better view of their relationships that you wouldn't get just from self-report seeing them once a week because sometimes people are gonna come on screen. We, we ask them not to have other people in the room, but inevitably there will be people that, uh, that crash the party and that you see in the background or that come in the room and you can see how they interact and that'll give you a, a little bit more insight into those relationships. Uh, of course, one of the reasons that uh, there was only 0.4% of us doing uh, telehealth before the pandemic is that people are wary of it. People are scared of it for lots of different reasons. And one is the safety of the client. They, they thought, we thought before this, uh, many of us that you couldn't do it because what if there's an emergency? What if the person's suicidal? What if the person uh, self injures? Uh, what am I gonna do in those situations? And of course you wanna be thoughtful about safety. So the first thing is to make sure that both uh, the therapist and the client 
has all of the phone numbers and addresses and emergency protocols in place before you get started. Um, and that's, that's a very basic uh, kind of thing that we do in telehealth. So note what I said there, phone numbers and addresses, as well as emergency protocols. So, um, so obviously if I'm doing video conferencing psychotherapy and there is a dropped call or some kind of, you know, they can't hear me or see me or something else that's going on, uh, then we use the telephone as a backup because telephones are ubiquitous and reliable. And so the, those are always there, uh, which is one of the reasons in a little while, I'll tell you why it's not a great idea to use the telephone for your video device if you can help it. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. But we use phone numbers as backup. So you always want to know their phone number. You want them to know your phone number so they can reach you. And you want to know addresses. So if there's a mental health emergency or a physical health emergency, you want to be able to get them help. So, um, so if that happens, you need to know where to direct the friend or the provider. So oftentimes in this work, we'll have them identify somebody that they're comfortable knowing that they're in therapy. And that person is the contact person. It, the label goes by different names uh, in, the, in the literature, but it's a, an important person to them that they trust. And so that person can drive over to their house and knock on the door and maybe has a key to the place and they can come and check on the person if there's an issue. So uh, you sign a release of information, you can reach that person, that's your first stop. Second stop would be calling the authorities, calling somebody to do a wellness check, things like that, like you normally would, but you can't do that if you don't know where your client is. So uh, the first step is to find out where they are. The second step is to document that. So in your progress note, you should always say, we did this through telehealth through video conferencing psychotherapy really, and uh, that they are at this location if it's not obvious from their intake uh, and other information. The other part of that is if you don't recognize where they are, you should ask. And that's really important uh, as we'll talk about later if they've left the state and you don't know about it. You would wanna know that because you're licensed for California probably. So things like that matter. Um, there was another situation, one of my colleagues who does a lot of uh, research in this area too, um, had study therapists on his trial. And one of his study therapists had a heart attack during session. And so the client needed to be, be able to get help for the therapist, which was a twist. So you might consider that too. Now, if you're doing this work from your home, you probably don't want your clients knowing your home address, understandably that you might tell them something about, you know, what neighborhood you're in or something so that people could pinpoint where you are in case that was needed. So just something to be thinking about. So we developed rules uh, over doing this uh, uh, over time. One was to prohibit family or friends from visiting during sessions. We uh, really meant that, especially for being in the same room, we don't like that. And secondly, really from being in the same house, if you can help it. These days, it's very hard to help that because it's COVID and all of us are together most of the time. So it's harder to do that. But you can ask them not to be in the same room. And, and we uh, started applying that rule because people would surprise us. We would be working with somebody and find out only in the middle of session that their partner was in the back corner off screen during the whole session. And we didn't know it. Like that's not good to know, to not know. So we asked people not to do that. Sometimes people would have their children in session because they couldn't find help, you know, childcare, uh, which might be fine if the child is three months old, probably not so fine if the child is seven. So um, things like that matter. So we asked them to really be considered about that. Um, in the early days, we would have people showing up uh, half naked or more than half naked in our sessions. And um, that was not great. Um, so we asked people to, to dress as if they were coming into our office, like a normal healthcare visit. And uh, we asked people to put their pets outside uh, to minimize distractions. Uh, we've actually had pets disconnect the equipment before. You'd see cats uh, walk past the camera and then there's no more feed. Or um, uh, people would use their pets to avoid. And so they'd be talking about something really hard, but they would have their dog or cat in their lap. And uh, they're probably not going to have their cat, cat or dog in their lap uh, for other things. And so that's something that we consider too. Let's talk a little bit about diversity issues when it comes to telehealth. So uh, it's important, first of all, to recognize that diversity and, uh, and culture goes beyond just race and goes beyond ethnicity. It includes lots of different things. 
if you're familiar with Pamela Hayes's work, she uses the addressing model, which considers some of, the, some of these more broad categories, uh, but includes lots of things. It includes gender, it includes age. Um, and uh, so you wanna consider all of those things. And of course you wanna consider the intersectionality of different facets of diversity. So if you're a woman and you're a person of color, both of those things matter, they intersect. Um, awareness of intersectionality can benefit telehealth and all psychotherapies. The more you know about these things, the better. So taking a, a culturally humble approach is a good idea as with everything we do. Uh, again, here's Pamela Hayes's model, um, which she originally uh, uh, published in 1996. Uh, back then it was addressing with one D and with the update in 2008, she added another D. And these are those. So these are all things that you could consider and really should consider for each client that comes in. Uh, Hilti and colleagues reported that telehealth has been shown to be effective across culturally diverse populations, including Latinx, Asian, and Native American populations. However, the, the fact that telehealth enables a distance between clinicians and people they serve mean uh, that they may not share a common language or geography or resources, or challenges, or other references like landmarks, things like that. So if I have a client that lives here in San Diego, in the city of San Diego, uh, we can talk about things. I know what they're talking about. If they use a kind of localized language or slang, I know what they're talking about. Um, but the further away my client is from me, the further we are away culturally too. There are regional differences in all of these things. So you just want to consider that. Uh, the, the, you know, you might be able, you know, we actually did this in our studies where we would uh, treat people in uh, Florida or on the East Coast because obviously they're three hours ahead of us. So their clinicians would be off at five o'clock, but we'd still be around for another three hours. And in the VA system, we were able to see each other all over the country, um, even if we were licensed just in one state. So we were able to do that. But again, um, it would change everything. It would change, you know, it might be dark there by the time you're doing uh, treatment and other things would change too. Uh, some populations, of course, have limited access to the hardware and internet connections involved in doing telehealth. Uh, Black and Latinx individuals are uh, as likely as white individuals to have a telephone, but they're less likely to have a computer. Uh, a dedicated teleconferencing room in local clinics can help to increase access to this care. And so we've got those set up in a lot of places. These are, these are rooms that used to be broom closets, sometimes literally, uh, that we converted to telehealth. But uh, after the pandemic, I can tell you that there are going to be more rooms that are dedicated for telehealth. And, and this is a very common question I get, so I'll answer it right now, which is, is this a temporary thing that we're doing or is it permanent? And the answer is, um, the answer is it's permanent. That doesn't mean that all of us are going to go full-time teleconferencing. Uh, and, and in fact, many of you, uh, by the end of this year, probably, are gonna go back to doing all of your services in person if you're not already. What it does mean is that now that all of us have had a taste of this and realize the advantages as well as the things that made it scary to us, a lot of us are gonna to wanna to keep doing it. I, I've already uh, spoken to colleagues who wanna keep doing this like forever. Uh, and of course, some of my colleagues already were doing it forever. Um, so that's one thing. But the other part of that is that the clients have had a taste of it and I can tell you clients are gonna demand this from their healthcare providers. They love things about it. And so they're gonna to, uh, wanna to keep doing it. So the permanent part is that almost every clinic, almost every hospital is gonna have a hybrid. They're gonna offer both things. That's my prediction. Uh, we'll see if it bears out, but I think it will. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, multifamily households may make privacy and telehealth more challenging. Uh, but may also provide opportunities for cross-generational assistance with technology. And so the downside is that people are crowded. That's true for COVID anyway. Um, and that's uh, true more in households of color. And uh, the upside of that is that if you have a seven-year-old who's trying to do this work with you and they might struggle with the technology, then their parents or grandparents could help them with that. Uh, likewise, if uh, an older adult is struggling with the technology, then their children or somebody else might be able to help them with that. So um, those are all things to think about. Interpreter services, translation apps, and visual analog scales can help to reduce language barriers. Um, so those things can be helpful. Um, and I have a lot of colleagues who do this work with interpreters. Uh, and it's certainly doable to have a third person in the room 
just like we do in person at those sites. Um, the challenge there always though, is if you're using an interpreter from the same community, which gives you the advantage of knowing the same language, the same references, all those things that we just talked about. The downside of that is that a lot of these communities are small, right? So if you're working for um, a group that, that hails from one country, um, then there might be a few hundred of those folks in your community. And if there's only a few hundred of those folks, they probably mostly know each other, uh, which is good and it's bad. So if they're uh, you know, good friends outside of here and now they're gonna be an interpreter and your client is gonna be revealing all their deepest, darkest secrets, that might not work so well. So in those cases, you can get an interpreter from you know, 100 miles away and, it's, and they're gonna work just as well in most cases. It's important for clinicians to increase their own awareness of other cultures. Uh, and you can do that lots of different ways through speaking to other people, reading, uh, viewing art, watching movies to reduce your own bias. Traveling works really well for that, of course, uh, back in the old days before COVID. Uh, an attitude of cultural humility will enable clinicians to see their own biases and ask about each person's individual experiences as they pertain to clinical care. Um, so the role of eye contact, for example, uh, may be really relevant uh, I've worked with clients who had uh, what I would deem very poor eye contact, but it was totally appropriate to their culture not to be making direct eye contact with me as an authority figure. And so it's things like that that you want to be aware of. Um, and again, if you're assigning in vivo exercises for them to do in the neighborhood, that is usually a great idea. Uh, and yet, if it's not a safe neighborhood or if it's not safe at night or something like that, you would want to know that. Any questions about uh, cultural or diversity issues? Okay. Let's talk about best practices for video conferencing psychotherapy. So it might be uh, a good idea for assessors and therapists to meet with the people they serve in person initially. So the very first time you meet to meet in person but it's not necessary to do so. And in fact, in all of my studies, so I had four huge studies, these million dollar studies, um, I did not require, I actually uh, didn't allow for people to meet in person initially. It was all done uh, via video teleconferencing because I wanted to see if it mattered. I wanted to see if people could actually have that first session and it go okay. Uh, and in fact, it went great. You know, People did really well in these treatments uh, for PTSD. And um, so you, you don't need to meet in person, but it depends on the person, right? You might have a client who's really, really wary about this or reluctant or paranoid or, and so in those cases, you might either meet with them in person or have a long phone call first or some kind of a foot in the door entry for those folks. You always wanna prepare a plan for dropped connections. Again, it doesn't happen a lot these days, but it depends on a lot of different factors, including your internet connection, if you're using Wi-Fi or Ethernet, things like that. So you always wanna assume that there will be a dropped connection at some point and have a plan in place for when that happens. So all of you are thinking, oh, if that happens, I'll use the telephone, which is a good idea. But what is gonna happen literally? Are you gonna call the client or are they gonna call you? And if they're gonna call you, do they have the phone number they need to call you? Things like that. So it's, it's the devil is in the details. So make sure that you've really thought through those details and included those in your informed consent and in your initial instructions to the client. If you're starting work with a new person, this is a, a new client that you haven't seen before, you wanna explain what telehealth will involve, have them sign a, a brand new consent form or a supplementary con, uh, consent form that's specific to telehealth. Um, and there's lots of examples out there Maria, I don't know if, uh, have you shared a sample consent form with them for um, I video conferencing? I have not, but um, I can send that through the email at the end of the training. Okay, and do you have that or do you want me to send it? Yes, if you could send that to me, that would, that okay. would be I'll, great. I'll Thank email you, Dr. You this and you can share it with them. Thank but you, Dr. There's Dr. lots Mark. of different uh, versions out there and uh, the easiest way to find them actually is just to go to psychotherapists and look at their homepage. And a lot of folks have their informed consent right there. So you can get a, a range of uh, different language that's used for things like that. If you're transitioning an, an existing person you serve on telehealth, explain that the mode of treatment will be slightly different. Of course, most of you have gone through this since March, um, but, uh, but what you would do is just talk to them and explain that you're gonna shift the way you do it. 
explain that treatment through telehealth works as well as in-person treatment, and that since most of your work together involves talking and seeing each other, relatively little will change. Describe the new modality as state of the art and cutting edge. You wanna convey your own excitement about it, even if you don't really feel excitement about it. And explain that you'll be learning the nuances of the technology together and that you're on the same team. That works really, really well. So it's one thing if the client feels really frustrated and their computer's not connecting and they figured out the video, but not the audio, those things that are common. Uh, and they feel like it's, uh, you know, that they're failing and that they're just frustrated. It's another thing if you say, oh, you know what, I just went through this last week with somebody else, or I just went through this myself two weeks ago, and it's so frustrating, I get it. Let's figure this out. You know, we'll, we'll get the better of the technology by the time we're done here. If you have that team approach, it really makes a big difference. Many of us uh, have experienced the blurred lines or fuzzy boundaries of providing remote services, particularly when you're doing video conferencing psychotherapy. Uh, the, the clients that you serve may see you from their home and they may not dress or groom like they normally would. They may eat during session. They may be interrupted by other people. Um, all of that's really different. And so you'll want to keep those things in mind. Likewise, you may see into their home, which can feel more personal than professional. So usually, you know, for most of us that were doing uh, FaceTime or Skype before this, we did it with our personal relationships and we would feel very comfortable and familiar with those folks. When you're doing it with clients, it's a whole new world. You're gonna see photographs on the walls, you're gonna see messiness, you're gonna see all kinds of things that you normally wouldn't do in a professional setting. Uh, we have worked with people who have arrived to VCP wearing pajamas or little clothing. We've worked with people who have called in from the bathroom, literally sitting on the toilet. We've worked with people, many people who have called in from bed uh, while they're driving a vehicle, while they're in a Starbucks, things like this. Not great for lots of reasons, right? So uh, again, don't wait until these things happen and say, oh, this is awkward, but can you not um, show up with your shirt off? That makes me feel weird. Don't wait until then. Have this conversation before you start to work with everyone, with each person, have it as part of your informed consent, and then it's not gonna be awkward because you're not hopefully gonna, gonna face uh, these issues too often. You wanna state your expectations before the first session. They should arrive on time. They should be dressed as they would for an, an office session, usually business casual, and they should typically not eat or allow dis distractions during session. Likewise, the therapist should dress professionally, typically not eat during session, not allow interruptions if you can help it. Um, you wanna be very aware of what the person can see through the camera. Uh, you know, if you have a mess behind you, if you have personal photos behind you, <clears throat> if they can see through the doorway to other people, you wanna be aware of those things. It may or may not be okay, but be aware of it. Um, therapists may be tempted to wear casual pants or shorts when doing video conferencing psychotherapy but consider uh, what the other side would see if you were surprised by an animal or bitten by an insect or a, a hurt child runs in the room and you have to jump up. You just wanna be aware of that. I'm not saying you can't wear pants or sweatpants or something. I'm just saying be aware of the consequences of that. Um, for yourself, you wanna have uh, comfortable uh, chairs. And for the other side, of course, uh, I have recommended heavy chairs that won't roll off the screen if you can choose that. But, you know, a desk chair on, on wheels or casters, not a great idea. Uh, the most important thing for video conferencing is to use good lighting. That's the most important thing. Uh, you want to have good lighting on your face. So usually the light source is going to be behind the device. Um, it could be anything. Uh, what I'm using right now is called a Loom Cube, L-U-M-E-C-U-B-E. -E. Uh, it just plugs in through USB. Um, I've got another device here that I can use to add additional light. Uh, there's all kinds of things, but you can use a window. You can use other things. Make sure the light is on your face so that the person can see your expressions. What you don't want is a light source behind you because you will be a silhouette. Uh, so if you have a window open behind you, if you have a light behind you, then your face is going to be dark. They're not going to be able to see you very well. So have good lighting. Uh, for a lot of the classes I teach, they start and it's daylight. And so I have the window open and everybody can see me fine. And then it gets dark in the middle of class. Uh, you know, it gets dark still at 530 or so. And um, so I always need to have another light source ready. In general, you want to uh, choose solid shirts and blouses. Uh, in the old days when this mattered more, we used to use uh, what we called telemedicine blue. Uh, and you wanna do that rather than patterns if you can, because sometimes patterns get weird on telehealth and that's still true today. 
Um, you want to allow some distance from the camera if possible to enhance your eye contact, right? So if I was like this and looking down at my slides, then it's even more obvious that I'm not looking right at you. Um, so the further our, uh, back you are, the better. Uh, and in general, you want to have a head and shoulders view. Uh, every class I teach, a lot of the class I teach have, you know, dozens of students. And so I always get to see a, a variety of backgrounds and virtual backgrounds and uh, how people have set up. And uh, quite often I'll have uh, students that are like this and they'll say, oh, Dr. Thorpe, I have a question for you. Right? And I don't even know who's speaking because I can't see their mouth anymore. So you want to be uh, thoughtful about how you look. Head and shoulders is usually your best bet. Uh, if you're doing this work, especially from home, you want to consider privacy. Um, and one of the issues that's obvious is that uh, when people are doing video conferencing psychotherapy, they tend to speak more loudly than usual. So like right now, I'm speaking more loudly than I normally would in a conversation, even though I know that these are really good mics and that uh, you can hear me clearly. It's just what we do. Um, you also want to be aware that walls in homes are thinner than they are in office buildings. Um, and so it's easier for people to eavesdrop whether they want to or not. Um, so the one easy solution to this is a white noise machine. Many of you use this in your clinics or in your hospital already. Um, they work great and you can buy them for 30 to $50 on the internet. And I can tell you they last forever. <clears throat> My wife and I are both psychologists. And so we've uh, had these at home partly for our children. So when we had babies, we wanted to block out any noise to keep them asleep. And uh, so literally every night we turn on a white uh, sound machine and the kids associate it with sleeping, it helps them to sleep and it blocks out noise. And literally every night for the past 13 years now, my, my oldest is 13, uh, we've turned it on. That's how well these things last, they go forever. So it, it's a really good investment uh, that you can use in your office or at home. Uh, at both sites, it's a good idea to have something to write on and to, something to write with at each location. As I said, uh, you can use clipboards, you can use a desk, you can use an end table, whatever works for those sites. Um, and it, you know, I do a lot of CBT and so we do a lot of reading and writing and so these things are required. You can consider having headsets um, and sometimes you have to have a headset. Some of the older devices don't have external mics that will pick up your voice without a headset. But another advantage of headsets is that they often block ambient noise. And so like Maria is using a headset with us today. So if she happened to have some noise going on in the background, it, we probably won't even hear it because we're gonna hear her voice and it's, it's uh, uh, vocalized on her voice. Uh, so that's kind of a nice addition. Uh, my wife and I um, had a, the house across the street from us burned down two years ago, almost to the day. And uh, so that was a big uh, deal, of course. And uh, for the past two years, they did nothing until about three months ago when we were really in the, in the heart of uh, fully converting to telehealth. And this house is maybe 20 feet away, 30 feet away, something like that, very close. And so they were doing all, using all these power tools and jackhammers and everything, which would have been devastating to us if we didn't have headsets. Literally, we couldn't have done our sessions. So luckily we had headsets and so we were able to do it and people didn't hear all the clanging going on in the background. You wanna consider storing blank forms and questionnaires and information sheets at the remote site if you can. So if you're uh, connecting to an office that's set up for telehealth and you've been using it for a long time, have a drawer uh, next to your client that's got all the questionnaires you want, all the education about uh, depression and anxiety, have all that right there or if you're working with them and they're at their home, you can literally just mail all this stuff to them ahead of time. Just mail them a packet that's got all this stuff in it. It might have 10 BDIs or PHQ9s for depression, for example, and then they can just fill them out each week or every other week, however you normally do it. You can consider having a fax machine with a clearly marked cover sheet. Um, and a lot of us don't have like old school fax machines, but in our homes, many of us do have all-in-one printers that include fax and scan and print. And so you can use something like that to uh, convey information to your client. Just be careful, as I said before, when you dispose of it, that you should destroy that as much as you can. Uh, or you can use a digital camera at each site to exchange completed documents and literally just show them that way. Uh, that's a little bit easier to do, to do if you're using a Mac versus a PC, but either one you can do it. 
Uh, and you can use software for signing digital documents like the informed consent. You can do that through Adobe for free. They have the sign feature. Uh, you can use uh, other sites like small PDF or sign now or DocuSign if you'd like. Uh, it's been very well established actually even before the pandemic that BCP can lead to fatigue. And that's definitely true uh, for lots of different reasons. One is that our brains are not used to constant gaze. And what that means is that if you're having a conversation with somebody, uh, you will talk to each other, you will look at each other, but you will not look at each other the whole time, right? It's one thing if you're having a conversation, you're like, hey, how's it going? And that's great. But it's another thing if you're just like, tell me how it's going. Oh, that's good. I'm doing well too. That's, that's great. But that's not the way we communicate with each other. We uh, have eye contact and then we break the eye contact. That's the natural flow of things. So it's weird when we're doing video conferencing psychotherapy because the eye contact is more constant. Even if it's an indirect gaze, it's still there all the time and your brain is registering that. That's even more true if you're doing group therapy or uh, like me, if you're teaching classes, then you have you know 20 or 30 eyeballs on you when you're doing this work and your brain is trying to process all of that. So your brain is sensitive to things like this, especially social cues, and it will be doing work uh, in the background, uh, even if you're not aware of it, and that takes energy. There's also less uh, information when you're doing a nonverbal exchange. And so again, we get most of the information that we would normally get, but not all of it. And so you have to work a little bit harder because you can't see their whole body. Uh, there's a, a need to be more physically expressive for the same reason. And so people tend to use their hands more and their facial expressions tend to be broader. Uh, that takes more energy. People tend to get more headaches when they're doing this work because they have a light source right on their face. Um, and so that can lead to headaches. People can also be distracted from their devices in a way that they normally wouldn't be because most of us um, will have our phones nearby. Most of us may get text messages or texts or other uh, chats coming up on our computer while we're doing this work, and that's distracting. And there's this blurring of work time and personal time, especially if you're working from home and the place where you eat or sleep or uh, relax is now the place where you work to. All of these things lead to more fatigue. That's very common. And so you wanna keep that in mind both for yourself to validate yourself at the end of the day if you feel more exhausted than you did a year ago, but also for your client and the need to take breaks uh, more often than usual. Again, provide breaks. Just like we did today, we split this in half. Uh, you know, and it's not the longest training in the world, but, uh, but we recognize that this takes more work. I'm giving you lots of information. So breaks are really important. And typically, if you're working with adults with no deficits, uh, a break every hour is a good idea. It could be five minutes or 10 minutes. Um, and if you're working with younger children or older adults or people with developmental disabilities or people with other issues, you might take breaks more often or make longer breaks. It really depends. Uh, when you take a break, make sure that you don't just sit there and look at your screen or check your email. You really wanna get up, uh, work your legs a little bit, get something to eat and to drink. Uh, and it's always a good idea to have snacks nearby, uh, especially if you, you know, end up doing an eight hour or 10 hour day on, on screen that you weren't planning for. So those are all good ideas. Try to avoid looking at screens during your breaks again. Um, you know, there's a joke uh, that's been going around about our daily routine, which is little screen, medium screen, big screen. And so we often wake up and look at our phone first thing, and then we're looking at the computer for the rest of the day. And then at night, we get to relax and look at the big screen and watch our shows. That's great, except it's not great to be doing that. Our brains are not really built for that. So uh, give yourself a break from the screens when you can. Um, and during breaks, really make sure that they're breaks. So I've, I've got colleagues who sometimes require their students to keep their cameras on so that they can make sure that they're there the whole time. That's not a great idea. If you're taking a break, take a break, turn off the camera, turn off the mic um, if you can. Uh, people can connect uh, for video conferencing psychotherapy through desktop computers, through laptops, through tablets, through smartphones. Uh, among other options. And the device may determine whether there's an external mic or not, uh, whether there's a camera or not, uh, whether backgrounds are possible or not. They're not possible on everything. Uh, and even the type of virtual background can be limited. Uh, how many people can be seen on screen at a time? Uh, so many of you are familiar with uh, gallery view or the Brady Bunch view where you can see lots of people on screen. 
You can do that on most computers. You can't do it on some phones and some other devices. Uh, and again, if there's a lot of external noise, uh, it's a good idea to use headsets. So as I said earlier, I want to encourage you to avoid using smartphones for video conferencing psychotherapy if you can. If you and the client can avoid it, I suggest that you do. Uh, for one thing, the screen size is too small. Even on the biggest phones, it's not gonna be as big as other devices. And if you're looking for subtle facial cues, like we often are, uh, you're gonna miss those. The portability of phones means that people may use them in poor uh, locations, like public locations. Uh, so again, we've had people in the hotel rooms or in uh, Starbucks or other uh, grocery stores, things like that. Not great for confidentiality. Um, or they're going to keep everything generic and uh, not uh, really relevant to what they're doing clinically, and that's not good either. Uh, the other thing is that if you've ever interacted with anybody on a, on a video conference call on a phone, you'll notice that the screen is almost always going to shake unless they're using a tripod, uh, which means that you're going to have a Blair Witch Project kind of experience the whole time, which is not good. So um, that's another downside. Uh, privacy may be compromised, as we talked about. Another big issue is that phones can overheat. Uh, when they're doing video, it takes a lot of work for a phone to do that. And so it's not uncommon for phones to overheat so that they don't work anymore and you just lost not just your video feed, but also the backup, the phone, um, which is not good. Phone minutes can be used if they're not on Wi-Fi. So if people are roaming, they're gonna be paying for that one way or another and, and using their data. Uh, smartphones limit options for accessing other apps during the call uh, and for watching videos. Sometimes they can't switch to other windows, things like that. Battery life is used very quickly by video. It really uh, sucks it up. And if the phone battery dies, again, you may not be able to reach them or they can't reach you because they don't have a phone anymore. So just be very thoughtful about that. See if there's another way for them to access uh, care. Any questions so far before we move on to chat? All right. So you can use chat or messaging features. Um, and usually those are gonna be part of the software for video conferencing psychotherapy. Uh, it can be a temporary backup if audio or video features are not working correctly. Uh, and that can happen for a lot of different reasons. Um, sometimes I'll be able to hear people quickly and I'll see uh, the icon showing that their video is working and yet all I see is blackness, I can't see them. Or sometimes um, I'll see things like this, which is to see their background, but not them. Uh, and so what that usually means is that their camera cover is on. And so you always wanna do that as part of your troubleshooting, see if uh, they've got their uh, camera cover on, cause that could be the problem. Um, the chat fe feature can also be used by the clinician to send links for websites and readings and videos. And so that's a great way to use the chat feature rather than saying, oh, there's a website, let me tell you the uh, name or let me tell you the long link, you can just cut and paste it, that's much simpler. If you are exchanging video while you're doing teleconferencing, make sure that you also share the audio. And so it depends on which software you're using, uh, but in Zoom, for example, if you're doing that, you can start showing the video. And as soon as you start showing the video, ask your uh, client or clients if they can see it uh, and hear it. Uh, because that's a separate thing. And so if, uh, if you're using Zoom, you actually need to go, uh, when you're presenting, it's gonna be on the top of your screen and you wanna go to more and then share computer sound. Um, and so if you're sharing videos, that's the way to do it. Um, a backup, a cruder method that we do use sometimes is to point the camera at another screen that plays the video. So if you have a portable DVD player or an, an old school DVD player, you can just point your camera at the screen and they can hear it fine. And so that works too. If you're recording sessions, make sure you get permission from people first, uh, add that to your consent form, provide the rationale for why you're recording. Um, it, every state is different in terms of the rules for recording. Some states you can record people without telling them. In California, it is against the law to record people without telling them, so you have to inform them. In, in most of the clinical work we do, we don't need to record, but sometimes you do. Keep in mind that one hour of video recording takes about 200 megabytes. It's, that's a big chunk of memory. Um, and so you can consider secure cloud storage for that if that's an option for you. 
the person on the remote side could take uh, photographs or video of your sessions, which you probably don't want. You probably don't want to see yourself as a therapist on YouTube somewhere. Um, so uh, be clear about your policy in writing, uh, which the policy is usually going to be that you forbid them taking pictures or, you know, screenshots or video of your sessions uh, for these reasons. Phones or recorders, including some therapy apps, can be used to record sessions if that's used as part of treatment. Um, and they can be used very well as part of treatment. We do that in Imaginal Exposure. It's part of the uh, PE Coach app. There's a recording uh, device in there. Um, but they may not work if headphones are used since they can't hear both sides of the conversation. So kind of think about that if one or both of you is using headphones. If you're exchanging written work, there's different ways to do it. Um, so you can uh, draw on a piece of paper to show something. So like when I'm teaching CBT, I always show the CBT triangle, the relationship between thoughts and feelings and behaviors every single time. And so I could either show them a slide that has that on it, or I can draw it and just hold it up to the screen. You can do it uh, however you like. Um, you can scan it with a digital camera or a scanner. There's lots of ways to do it. You can fax it to the person. Uh, providers can also write directly on a whiteboard screen um, within the software. <clears throat> there's a way to do that. Um, there's also a way to annotate a screen if you're using uh, PowerPoint slides, things like that. And I'll show you an example of that when we talk about engaging the client. You can also use virtual backgrounds, of course, like I'm using now. Uh, this isn't my uh, you know, fashionable uh, apartment behind me. This is just a random virtual background. Um, that might be an option if your computer allows it. It, it. Some of the less powerful computers will not do it. Some phones will not do it. It depends on what you're doing. Uh, you can use video backgrounds too. So mine comes with the default of the, you know, Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights or uh, the ocean. And so if you want something moving behind you, you can do that if they're not too distracting. Um, and the advantage of virtual backgrounds is that they give you flexibility. Um, so, uh, you know, if a room is messy behind you, you can use a virtual background. If you have to present uh, from your bed or somewhere, you can use a virtual background. Um, so all those things uh, are, work well with virtual backgrounds. Uh, and you want to choose professional and enticing backgrounds. Um, there's lots of backgrounds to choose from. You can do lots of different things. And so, uh, you know, sometimes if I'm uh, doing a DBT training, I might change to something like this with bamboo in the background or something like this or something like this uh, to kind of, uh, you know, be consistent with my theme. Uh, if I'm doing a, a more standard uh, presentation to a, a group, I might do other things. It depends on, on what you want. Uh, if I'm working with kids, uh, I might do something like a, a cupcake or a Disneyland, something like that to engage them a little bit more. So really consider kind of what you're doing, who you're working with um, when you're choosing your virtual backgrounds. The other thing is, you know, you can get a, a, a zillion virtual backgrounds for free, but the quality really varies. And so, um, so really kind of keep that in mind. And uh, one of the things to look for is virtual backgrounds that are in HD or uh, 1080 um, uh, quality, because if you get anything that's lower quality at all, even, even 720 and below, uh, it'll look really grainy, really pixelated, because keep in mind that it's, it's filling up your whole screen. So it gets really big. So you really want kind of high def uh, images. And you can just Google those uh, to say free Zoom virtual backgrounds HD, and you'll get uh, those options. Uh, be aware that the camera may not display the speaker or objects as well if you're using a virtual background. So if you're trying to show somebody a book or the person trying to show you something, it may not appear on the screen. So I've got a pen here. And again, sometimes uh, you can see it and then you see how it passes out of the screen uh, in certain ways. So you want to be aware of issues like that when you're using a virtual background. Any questions about any of those considerations? Okay, let's talk about privacy and safety, and then we'll um, conclude by talking about some engagement strategies. So we've uh, written quite a bit about uh, privacy and safety concerns, including the uh, informed consent process. 
Uh, HIPAA, of course, is at the forefront of a lot of our minds. Uh, and HIPAA, as you know, has been around for a long time, since 1996. It's uh, functioning today much differently than it was designed to function. Uh, uh, but uh, the evolution is what matters to us now. HIPAA doesn't make any exceptions for telehealth. It doesn't have a separate section on telehealth. Uh, the telehealth that was available in 1996 was very crude. They weren't even really thinking about it. Um, but if you use uh, 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 telehealth to convey protected health information, then you have to meet all the requirements of HIPAA, just all the standard requirements of HIPAA, which means that you have to keep everything confidential and private and secure. Uh, technologies themselves are not HIPAA compliant, even though some companies will say that their products are HIPAA compliant. Uh, the obligation isn't for us as covered entities uh, to use HIPAA compliant devices. The obligation is for us to have an organized and documented set of security practices. That's what's key. So uh, HIPAA is never going to say what you need is FIPS 120 compliance, right? Uh, because those things evolve, technologies evolve. So they're not going to say, you know, you must have this quality of internet connection or that you must use this kind of encryption. Those things change literally day to day. So what they do say is that you have to have an organized and documented set of security practices that are reasonable. So that, uh, you know, somebody can't just intercept it and see your whole interaction. Technology can provide tools to make uh, security even better. And that can include things like electronic passwords, data encryption. So if somebody was to intercept our uh, interaction right now over Zoom, chances are even if they intercepted it, they wouldn't be able to make heads or tails of it because because Zoom is encrypted. And most uh, video software is encrypted so that they wouldn't be able to interpret what they got. Uh, of course, we all probably use firewalls. You can use electronic signatures. You can use backup systems for recovering from disasters. All of those things can help uh, make an argument that you are HIPAA compliant. Um, the encryption of emails could help to provide a reasonable safeguard uh, for protected health information. So rather than just providing a generic uh, email, you can actually encrypt it. Uh, providers should check with the uh, state board related to their discipline and with professional organizations for additional guidance regarding telehealth. Again, this is updated all the time. The laws change uh, frequently. In March of 2020, after we went into lockdown here, the Office of Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services issued a notification. Uh, and that notification stated that during the COVID-19 public health emergency, it would exercise discretion and not impose penalties for non-compliance with HIPAA requirements against covered health care providers in connection with the good faith provision of telehealth during this public health emergency. So they're essentially saying, we get it, that all of you are new to this, all of you are transitioning, a lot of you don't have the infrastructure for this and you're trying to play catch up. We understand that. So we're gonna give you some leeway. Uh, and as far as I know, that notification is still uh, in use, uh, although that could uh, transpire at any point and it could change at any point. So kind of stay up to date on that. Uh, you can also use uh, popular applications that allow for video chats. So they said that you can use Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, Google Hangouts, Zoom or Skype. Uh, and before that, they didn't necessarily allow those um, uh, public applications. Providers are encouraged to notify our clients that these third-party applications potentially introduce privacy risks. Uh, and providers should enable all available encryption and privacy modes when using these applications. There are no applications that are 100% secure. It is not possible to guarantee to your client that nobody could ever see this. You can't guarantee it. Um, and so you should make that clear in your informed consent as well. Applications that are public facing, such as Facebook Live or Twitch or TikTok, should not be used in the provision of telehealth, obviously, because the public can see them. Providers who want additional privacy protections for telehealth should enter into HIPAA Business Associates Agreements, or BAAs, in connection with the provision of their video communication uh, products. Um, and these BAAs um, can be fairly simple to, uh, to put together depending on what software you're using. Any individual or entity, uh, which includes the telehealth software company that performs activities on behalf of a covered entity, which is us, that requires them to access uh, PHI is considered a business associate. Uh, so the software company is a business associate with us and we would want to get an agreement from them. 
A BAA specifies each party's responsibilities in the form of an agreement between the covered entity and the business associate. So you may or may not be aware of these BAAs already in your um, organization, but if your facility has custodial staff coming in to clean up, for example, which they probably do, they probably have a BAA with that company saying, if you happen to come across confidential information, you can't share that with anybody, you're not to read it, all those kinds of things, it's, it's built in. There are no uniform prerequisites for delivering telehealth uh, because those vary state by state. Uh, they state they vary by public and private insurance providers, and they vary by modes of services. So if you're doing email versus video conferencing. The notification includes a list of some vendors that represent that they provide HIPAA compliant video communications uh, and that they will enter into a HIPAA BAA. And those include uh, Skype for Business, Updocs, VC, Zoom for Healthcare, Doxy, Google G Hangouts. Uh, there is a good video on trying out Doxy.me and creating a BAA. So this link will take you there. And uh, for those of you that use Doxy, it literally just leads you through it. It probably took me five minutes to put together a BAA because you just plug in some information about your license and other things, and then it produces the document uh, and it's really straightforward. There are several aspects of mandated reporting and informed consent that are unique to telehealth. So when you're uh, thinking about confidentiality, you wanna have a broader perspective, of course. You and your client uh, may not be located in the same state as one another, uh, unless you're working within a federal system like the VA healthcare system, where licensed mobility law is in place, you must be licensed in the state where the person you serve is situated. So where your patient is or where your client is is what matters, what state they're in. As a mandated reporter, you must also be aware of the confidentiality rules in your own state of licensure and the state where the person served as receiving services. You may be mandated to report in both states depending on the laws of each jurisdiction. Accordingly, the informed consent form you prepare should note that mandatory reporting laws vary by, uh, by state and contain language that allows you to follow mandatory regional or national laws. It's good practice to start each session by confirming the specific location of the other person, as I said before. And um, if they're using virtual backgrounds each time, you might not be able to tell. And in those cases, you should ask them, are you still here in San Diego? And tell them why, you know, tell them why you're asking each time, but that's why. So uh, they could be at home, they could be staying with friends somewhere else, they could be in a hotel room in another state, you don't know. And you're trying to ensure that you're, in, you know, that they're in the state that you think that they're in. You can also, again, enable the authorities to reach them if they're in a different place, right? So if they are in a hotel room in Nevada, in Las Vegas, and you don't know that, then you send the cops to do a wellness check and the cops are gonna show up at the wrong place. So make sure you know where they're physically located. Uh, this is especially true if you live near a border, a state border or a country border as we do, um, because that changes everything. And, and it's very easy for people to go to Nevada uh, back east, of course, you can cross a state in 40 minutes, and so uh, that's even more common. Providers should always use private locations, and people should not receive telehealth services in public settings, except in unusual circumstances. If it's an emergency or something, then you have to, but really you should avoid it when you can. Uh, and if you have to do that, you want to lower your voice so that people can't overhear. Uh, you should not use the speakerphone or have your client not use speakerphone and recommend, uh, recommend that they keep a reasonable distance from other people if they're talking about PHI. If you're doing telehealth, uh, make sure to state that in your notes. So every note should say this was conducted via telehealth. Be sure to document any clinically relevant telehealth issues, like if they're frustrated with the technology, describe if portions of the session had to be conducted by telephone rather than by video conferencing. Uh, a blank informed consent form can be sent to the person seeking services. You can do that in the mail, or you can do it by private fax or email or upload, um, and then they can sign it and return it to you in one of those ways. In the very first progress note, state that you provided the information for informed consent uh, in that document. So state that you gave informed consent before you started treatment. Uh, when security measures are discussed in informed consent forms, the language should be non-technical so that most people can understand it. Uh, 
on those forms, it should also be stated that even with security measures, security cannot be absolutely guaranteed, as I said before. Informed consent procedures should uh, address how information will be released to others, including insurance carriers or other providers, just as they normally would. If you can't get written informed consent, you can do verbal informed consent and you should uh, get that and of course you should document it. Uh, when the pandemic first started, there was a lot of media coverage about Zoom bombing, this idea that people could pop into your sessions unannounced. And it, uh, and it was especially true on Zoom actually, that the, the software really was in its early days and didn't have a lot of security measures in place. And so people would and could uh, just pop into random uh, Zoom calls out there and uh, at the least uh, interrupt and uh, you know kind of startle people. At the worst, they would do things like share pornography videos and things like that. So that wasn't great. And um, so one way to prevent that is to, to require the person to enter a meeting ID and a password that you share only with them. Uh, and you can also uh, do what Maria did here today and to have people come into a waiting room before they come into the call. And you can make sure that you know who the person is before you let them in. So you could pre-screen them that way. Um, some of the clients we serve may prefer an additional layer of privacy by using an alias as a login name for the teleconferencing software. That's totally fine for them to do that as long as you know their alias. So make sure that you've texted or called ahead of time because if they say this is uh, Jane Doe and you don't know who Jane Doe is, you're going to keep her out of the waiting room. Um, so you need to know what that is. There could be intentional or unintentional eavesdroppers on telehealth sessions. You want to ask the person if there's anyone else present in the home or in the room, as I said before. Uh, you don't want to be caught off guard with that. Uh, it's imperative to have clear and concise emergency procedures developed and written down prior to engaging in behavioral telehealth for safety and potential crises. Um, you want to assess their current level of safety, including their physical health, uh, suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation, uh, non-suicidal self-injury, what we used to call parasuicide. Um, you want to have all of that documented. And then you want to consider other emergencies that you might not think about, like fire alarms going off or bomb threats or weather alerts or other emergency alerts on either side. Let the person know where you're located when that's possible and what the plan is. So if any of these emergencies happen, what's gonna happen? What are you gonna do? Who's gonna contact which person and how are you gonna contact each other? So have those things in place ahead of time just in case they happen. You know, no client wants to see their therapist suddenly off screen and then wonder what happened to them. Any questions about safety, confidentiality, security? We did have a question in the chat feature, Dr. Okay. Thorpe. Um, the question reads, so if your client goes on vacation or has to be out of town for any reason, especially with COVID, quarantine, et cetera, um, should you not provide service if they are out of the state? Generally, yes. Generally, it's a good idea just to take a break, especially if it's just for a week. I would skip the week most of the time. Um, the exception, of course, is if your client is in crisis and they really need that session, then you can. And most states allow for that. You, you want to make sure that you're talking to the board in both California and the other state to make sure that's okay. But most states uh, have a limit on how much you can do that. Like if you're doing it like three or four weeks out of the year, most states don't like that because it seems like you're doing care in their state without being licensed. But if it's a one or two time thing, most states will allow for that. So just make sure that you've got approval. Uh, make sure again, that you know all the state laws when it comes to confidentiality. Like, you know, in California, if a client reports uh, intimate partner violence to us, we don't have to report it. Other states, you do have to report it. So it's things like that that you wanna make sure that you're up to speed. So, um, so it, you can do it. In general, I avoid it. Um, so that's what I'd say about that. Hi, this is Lisa Thurston. I have another question along that same lines. Um, I'm supervising several case management um, persons toward their licensure. I have one of them who has a client who's in a case management client, though, uh, who's in Mexico for three months. And they are doing sessions. Uh, I don't know if I need to address that as her supervisor. 
I would. I, certainly, I've heard a number of folks doing that as well, crossing uh, country uh, borders as well as state borders. So I, I would figure out what, what needs to happen. I would have your the person you're supervising call the state board, or you could call the state board and find out what they would recommend. And probably there's somebody that you'd want to contact on uh, the Mexican side as well. And I think each province has their own rules, just like all of our states have their own rules. And so I would figure out uh, what kind of agreement you need in place, especially for if it's for the longer term. Again, if it was a one-time thing, uh, probably the country of Mexico would allow it. Uh, but if it's longer than that, there would probably be other issues to consider. So I would check with both boards. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. All right. Any other questions about safety, security, privacy? Um, I have one more question. So uh, the participant would like to know if the client could choose to use the phone to do the session, could they do that? And then if I'm misreading the question, um, please feel free to chat me and I can read that or you can feel free to um, mute yourself to explain further. And when it comes to phone, um, as I said, there's evidence that uh, telephone therapy can be very therapeutic and it can be really helpful. It's definitely better than nothing. And clients can certainly choose it. However, the caveat here is how you get reimbursed. And as I said earlier, Medicare will not reimburse typically for phone only visits. So you just want to uh, make sure that the third party payer is going to pay you if it's a phone visit. Um, so keep that in mind. But otherwise, when it comes to uh, providing services, telephones work well, just not as well as video conferencing. Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. And again, you can do a hybrid too, right? So you can uh, have the first contact be a 10 minute phone call or 15 minute phone call for you to describe the technology and the services that you provide. Uh, and then uh, if they feel comfortable, then you can move on to video or you can have part of your first session by telephone and then convert to video. So keep all that in mind too. Um, all right, well, let's talk about engagement strategies, which a lot of people are interested in. Most of the questions I get are about engagement. Um, some people may be hesitant to try uh, telehealth at all because of their symptoms. So if you're working with clients with paranoia, if they have ideas of reference, if they, uh, pr prior to COVID-19 and prior to telehealth, um, thought that the TV or the radio or the computer were communicating with them, for example, uh, now they are correct because you're going to do video conferencing, psychotherapy with them. Um, and so that might thing, make things more challenging. And so you'd want to explain to them and work with them. And it's different for every client. If your client has a great mistrust of authority and the government and feels like they're being uh, eavesdropped on, Again, they are correct. We, we now know that the government does listen in on phone calls and other things and the Patriot Act allows a lot of things. So, um, so that's true to an extent, but you can tell them that your understanding, which is the, this is as private as can be and that it's secure in all these different ways and share that with them um, and, uh, and tell them that you're gonna protect their confidentiality to the extent possible by law and uh, reassure them the best you can. Um, uh, and some clients have a, a general fear of technology. It's actually called technophobia. Uh, and that's true for some older clients and some younger clients, that it's not just that they feel uncomfortable with teleconferencing, but also with computers in general, with their telephone, with their remote control, with lots of things. And so they're uneasy about that, understandably. So those are all issues to consider. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of that in a minute. Um, some people don't like to see their selves, themselves on screen. They don't like to see their own image. And, uh, and typically you can hide their own image. So if you go to your own image right now, kind of uh, hover your cursor over your face, and then you'll see the three dots, the three horizontal dots, click on that, and it can say hide self view. You can select that and you will disappear from the screen. You don't have to see yourself anymore. This happens sometimes with uh, clients with uh, body dysmorphia or with other issues. Um, and so if they don't like seeing themselves, they can hide themselves. Uh, if you just hid yourself and you don't know how to find yourself again, because you can't click on yourself again, just click on somebody else's picture and click on their three dots and it will say like show self again or whatever it says. So that's an option for folks. Some individuals may be reluctant to have intimate conversations over a computer, uh, but in fact, many are 
uh, comfortable, even more comfortable having intimate conversations over a computer. It really depends on the person. We actually did a big conversion about, mm, eight years ago, I guess, at the VA, where we converted all the paper and pencil questionnaires to uh, electronic versions. We would just hand them a tablet and have them go through that. And we found that a lot of people felt more comfortable doing it into the tablet because they weren't sitting three or four feet across from a person. They didn't feel judged. They didn't feel like the person could share it with their neighbor. Even though, of course, we all know that when it goes into a tablet, like the person with the tablet could share it in lots of different ways. But people, some people felt much more comfortable putting it into a tablet and would reveal more about themselves to this, uh, you know, faceless uh, thing. So that's interesting. Uh, as with in-person meetings, building and maintaining rapport is important via telehealth. Of course, that's always true. I do a lot of trainings and a lot of different types of psychotherapy. All of them talk about rapport building. All of us know that it's important, but it's not right like rapport building is a thing either, right? It's not like now I shall take five minutes with Laura and introduce myself and build some rapport. Like it, rapport building is not a thing. It's not a set of procedures. It's what we all do in our own way to uh, build this relationship. And so you just do what you normally do and it's gonna come across great. Unless you're tapping your legs to build rapport, you're gonna be in great shape. Uh, it's helpful to discuss the use of telehealth by telephone before trying the new modality, particularly if somebody seems hesitant or is uh, known to be challenging in some way, then you can start that way, that's fine. The most important thing to be clear about uh, uh, what the new format will be using simple terms. So you can just say, we can see and hear each other over a video link. Most people will understand that clearly. Uh, validate and normalize any anxiety the person may report about using the technology in telehealth. That's really, really important. Um, it could be that you are a seasoned old pro now and you've been using it for you know 10 months and you feel very comfortable with it and that's wonderful. Uh, and yet a lot of clients are brand new to it, literally never used tele, you know, teleconferencing technologies before. So you just wanna say, oh, I totally get it. I remember the first time I used it, I was nervous about it too. I, it's totally understandable and don't worry because I'm here with you all along the way and I'm gonna show you uh, what's involved here. So, so don't worry about that. Uh, you're not gonna break anything, it's fine. That will help a lot of people. Uh, you also want to reinforce their use of technology. And so when they first start doing it, if, if you say, hey, click the button up there, when they click the button, they'll say, oh, that was awesome. That's, that's perfect. Now I can see you or, uh, you, you know, you muted yourself. That was wonderful. And now I want you to keep yourself muted for a second. Let's try the chat feature. And then you try that. So you really want to praise them for all the good work they're doing uh, and use humor uh, to make fun of yourself and make fun of the technology, uh, praise them a lot and have lots of patience. Some of your clients will pick this up, even if they're brand new to it, within two minutes and they'll never think about it again. Other clients will take more than a session to feel comfortable and to uh, get kind of facile with, with using the technology. That's fine. Uh, be patient with them. Older adults may, be, uh, may take a little bit longer. That's been my experience and that's what the empirical data say. Um, so take your time with them. Some older and younger adults may have technophobia, as I said earlier. So you wanna encourage them to test out the features and let them know that again, they can't break the computer. It's not gonna explode or start smoking. Um, they can explore different options in the software and that will help them uh, engage and work with it. You can give them a quick tutorial just like Maria did uh, for us today to orient them to the software and repeat that as often as necessary. Uh, some people may be nervous initially and you can validate that most nerves will fade after a few minutes. People uh, typically forget that they're even doing video conferencing after about five minutes. Uh, certainly it's a good idea to ask them about prior experience with video conferencing and not just in a professional setting. Um, so if they've ever done uh, chats with their grandchildren on FaceTime or Skype, that counts. And you should say, oh, that's great. I'm so glad to hear you've had that experience. What was it like for you? What did you like about it? Was there anything you didn't like about it? Um, things like that. Uh, describe your work together as a team to learn how best to use this new tool. You can self-disclose about your own early missteps with it or about your own anxiety with it. Or if you want to take the other tack, you can uh, show credibility with your experience using it. Um, even if you're fairly new to it, this is a trick I, I teach all my uh, students when they're starting out. Nobody wants to be the guinea pig for a therapist their very first session. 
So I have the student say, well, we've been doing this treatment for years now, and we found that it works well for clients, even if it, they're, it's their very first session. Instruct your clients not to have other devices around if they can help it, including portable video games, unless they need them to prevent distractions. So even if they have their phone face up in front of them, of course, they're going to get texts, they're going to get notifications. So it's best not to have that, even if they want their phone in arm's reach, they can just have it face down or in their pocket. Let's talk about engagement with older and younger adults. Um, one thing that works well almost universally is to share stories about pets popping up on screen. Um, people like to hear about that. People usually like dogs and cats and other pets. And so if you share stories about that, I personally have uh, guinea pigs. And so uh, I'll share stories about um, Snickers or Milky Way and, and what they're doing. And people love to hear those stories. You can use drawing, uh, again, with either the whiteboard board feature, which literally just shows a white screen that you can draw on, or you can annotate. And to annotate, um, for you, I think it's gonna be at the bottom of your screen. Go ahead and hover on the bottom of the screen and it should say annotate. And click on that. And then you can click draw or stamp or text. Depends on what you wanna do, but you can choose any of those right now. And you could um, draw on my slide here. Uh, and do anything you want. And so kids, older adults, younger adults love doing this. Uh, you can do all kinds of things on it. And so th that's kind of a fun way to uh, get them interacting with the technology in a fun way at the start. Uh, and of course you can use it clinically too. You can actually use it for psychoeducation. I could, uh, you know, uh, draw the, uh, the CBT triangle here, for example, and uh, teach them about that. So those are all ideas. All right, very nice artwork. I'm gonna, I'm gonna clear it now, uh, but good work. Um, it's a good idea to limit time on screen, especially for, uh, for kids or for some older adults or other folks. Um, and you wanna use their eye contact as a guide. So if you notice that you're trying to do a, a psychotherapy session and the person's like looking down or looking away and, and seems distracted or bored, it's probably time for a break. So pay attention to that. Uh, you might start with five minutes uh, in the first session, 10 minutes in the second session. It really depends on who you're working with. Uh, you can include images and colorful virtual backgrounds to draw attention. Um, so if you are showing slides, you can include lots of uh, good images. There's a Facebook page on teleplay if you're working with kids uh, that I recommend. And so there's the link for that. Uh, and it's got lots of ideas that you can work with kids and a lot of them work for adults too. So there's all kinds of cool ideas there. You can invite the client you're working with to show you their pets, uh, to hold them up to the camera, which uh, both builds rapport and teaches them where the camera is and how to interact with you that way. You can give instructions for them about building things with Lego bricks if they have them or drawing or coloring or doing Simon Says. All of those are easy on telehealth. You can show them gadgets or decorations or toys from your office or home and ask them if they've ever seen anything like that before and what they like about it, what they don't like about it, things like that. You can observe communication by watching the person play games with other people in their household and see how they interact. Uh, if you're interested in it, you can look at their fine motor skills, things like that uh, to, to observe them in a new way. Or, you can use a partner, what we sometimes call a confederate or a mole, whatever you wanna call them at the remote site. This is your partner that can help you translate. So if you're working with kids, we all know that if you've got a, a two-year-old, you understand them really well, but nobody else in the world understands them. So you can have somebody translate for you that way, or if it's a different language, of course, uh, they can model behaviors for the client and show them how to use the technology or how to do other things. You can have that partner reward behavior. So if the client does something that you like, you can have the person give them M&Ms or something else, uh, or they can do other things in the room to help engage that client. Uh, one of the things that works really, really well is a scavenger hunt, especially if you're working with a, a, either a therapy group or a group of kids. Uh, you can say, I want you to find these five objects in your house and then hold them up to the camera for me and whoever uh, is first gets a point and whoever gets the most points wins some kind of prize. Uh, and usually in that list of five things, I have it ready ahead of time and I'll put on something like dirty socks or something just to make them laugh. And then they race off to get it. And kids love it. Adults love it. Uh, scavenger hunts work really well. You can play Battleship. If both of you have Battleship game, you can play it virtually. Um, you can play lots of online games together, including Checkers and Tic-Tac-Toe and Monopoly. 
uh, to get uh, acquainted and to build rapport. Uh, you can teach them how to orient to the camera in different ways. You can have them guess your feelings. So you can say, okay, what am I feeling right now? And just have them guess that, which is both uh, teaching them to use the technology and it's kind of a clinical assessment at the same time in terms of alexithymia. Uh, you can play name that tune, uh, play them a few songs. Of course, you want it to be uh, relevant to them. So don't maybe play songs from the 20s for your seven-year-old uh, and vice versa and see if they can guess the song. Uh, this is something we use a lot that, again, has that engagement and clinical quality to it. They can write down emotion words or draw emotional faces or emojis and use a prompt for each one and say, so let's say happiness. What are three words to describe how this feels? If you feel like this, how would you look? Uh, when did you last feel like this with your family? How can others help you when you feel like this? So you can get a lot of good information about how they manage different emotions while engaging them. Uh, this is a grounding exercise that a lot of us use uh, in general, and it works well over video conferencing as well. Uh, and this grounding exercise usually looks like this. So this is what we call the five, four, three, two, one. So tell me five things that you can see. Tell me four things that you can feel like your feet on the ground or your butt in the chair, uh, the temperature of the air around you. Uh, tell me three things you can hear, which would be the air conditioning or cars going by or birds. Tell me two things that you can smell. And for smell and taste, you can have them move to another room and grab something so that they're not having to smell the computer or the mouse or something or taste anything around them so they can grab something that's actually food to do those with. Um, there are lots of breathing exercises you can do. You can have them touch their longest fingertips, touching on their belly and notice that when they take a nice deep breath that their fingertips will move apart you can notice that it's cool air going in and warm air coming out. You can have them uh, trace their fingers and take an uh, inhale going up and an exhale going down. You can get nice 10 slow breaths doing that. Um, you can use stuffed animals to kind of show the breathing in and out, or you can use a, a Hoberman sphere like I've got pictured here to show that breathing in and out to kind of catch their attention if you're teaching that or progressive muscle relaxation. So those are all ideas uh, and I'm, I'm gonna end here in a minute. And so, so when we end, in addition to questions, if you have any other strategies that have been helpful for your client population or in your facility, I'd love to hear about them. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about troubleshooting. So you wanna consider starting with brief initial sessions of video conferencing psychotherapy and then expanding the time as comfort grows. Again, depending on your population, you might be able to do an hour, an hour and a half right from the get-go with no problems. But uh, if you're working with small kids or older adults, you might start more briefly. Get release of information and enlist family members or caregivers to help the person with the technology if needed. You want to consider the capabilities of the person and their uh, internet connection. <laughs> so slow computers or routers or internet speeds can cause audio and video problems, obviously. All of us have had that experience. Uh, it's best to have 15 uh, megabytes per second download and five megabytes per second upload if you can uh, for this video connection. Uh, to find your speed, you can just do an internet speed test um, on your computer or on their device. And of course, if you're plugged into the wall, it's gonna be faster than if you're using Wi-Fi. that's always true. So if they're having a lot of trouble, you might encourage them to plug in directly. If the person often shows up late or no-shows, you would follow your normal procedures to coax them to change. You could explore the possibility that's related to the video conferencing psychotherapy and offer other formats if they're available. Uh, again, if you can hear them and not see them, check that they've turned on the video option, uh, which is called Start Video here in Zoom, and that they don't have the camera cover on. And when all else fails, log out of the software or uh, turn off and on the computer almost always that will solve problems. Rebooting almost always helps. So there are advantages and some challenges to using telehealth technologies. Uh, video conferencing psychotherapy can help improve access to behavioral services. The data are very promising, but as I have noted, there are issues to consider. And the use of engagement strategies can help to orient the person that you serve and make them more comfortable. Here are some great websites if you're interested in getting more information. All of these are fantastic. I use them a lot myself, so you can check them out.